There are many stories within the Resident Evil universe, sources from video games, movies, novels, and comic books, all have their own characters, villains, and creatures. While some of these things will appear in specific stories, you can sometimes find characters that will connect with other avenues of media. For example, how a comic book story is connecting to a video game, or how a movie will mention things from a video game. There's a lot of lore within this franchise, so I have compiled a one hour video of all the topics I have covered in the past. This video will be all about Resident Evil lore. Topics that I will include are these. Who is Mr. X, the tyrant in Resident Evil 2? The story of William Birkin and his G-Virus. The hidden story of Ada's boyfriend. Lore around the nemesis tyrant. What is the Code Veronica virus? The story of Hunk. The true origins of Albert Wesker. The hunter creatures explained. And the lore around the liquors. I will leave timestamps to make it easier for you. If you enjoy these one hour videos, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. I will have more videos in this format in the future. Thank you for watching and enjoy the video. What is the Nemesis Tyrant in Resident Evil? Why was it created? The Nemesis was designed by a branch of the Umbrella Corporation during their research in creating bioorganic weapons. The Tyrant virus, which is known as the T-Virus, is one of a few strains of the progenitor virus which came from West Africa. The virus was found in the 19th century and was documented by Henry Travis. His work was later found by Edward Ashford and Oswell E. Spencer, who funded a search in the 1960s. They found that a specific plant would create the progenitor virus under certain conditions, like being stored in a cave. The Umbrella Corporation would push out the native people in order to locate the Garden of the Sun, a secret underground garden which was in the ruins of the once great Nidipaya Kingdom. The scientists of Umbrella would alter the progenitor virus in different strains, the type A virus would kill the host in a few days, but also destroy their minds, to a point where they would drift into unconsciousness and also suffer from memory loss. The type B virus did fuse with the DNA of the host to create a stronger life form, but it affected her ability to write after a few days. She still retained some level of intelligence, but not enough to satisfy Umbrella. The virus was altered over the years by Dr. James Marcus. He was finally satisfied with the mutation caused by exposure to leech DNA. This later became known as the T-Virus. This strain would not kill the host like the progenitor virus, but it would cause violent outbursts like cannibalistic impulses, loss of intelligence, and necrosis. Because its brain would become useless after this mutation, Umbrella would create the NE-alpha type parasite, which would take control of the host's brainstem and act as a second brain. This parasite was developed through gene manipulation and was used on a host infected with a T-virus. This parasite was later used on hunters to provide more sufficient data in their use. The host infected by the T-virus would have increased strength because of the infection, but the parasite would be able to follow orders. One problem with the parasite is it would eventually destroy the host over time, but a breakthrough occurred when a team implanted the parasite into the brain of Lisa Trevor who was used as a guinea pig for 19 years of testing. Her brain would absorb the parasite and inherit its strengths. This led to a primitive version of the G-Virus. The G-Virus was meant to give the host increased strength and abilities while still retaining their intelligence and control of their mind. And together, all this research led to the creation of Nemesis. This B.O.W. is different from the normal tyrant because Nemesis is fully controlled by a commander and was aimed for military operations. The tyrant model that was used to create Nemesis was the T-003. At that time, this tyrant was compliant with programming and was very effective at their tasks. 
The tyrants were supposed to be the ultimate life form, and if they took enough damage, they would mutate into stronger versions. Any living organism that was attacked by Nemesis would become infected and turn into zombies. This was different from a host that was infected by the G-Virus. It would create offspring by inserting an embryo into a host. Another difference between these two types is that during a mutation, Nemesis will not grow large hands and claws like a normal tyrant. Because it has DNA from a parasite, part of its mutation would be around the tentacles. Nemesis was sent into Raccoon City to eliminate the surviving members of the STARS team from the incident at the mansion. Umbrella could not risk having their secrets exposed by them. They would send in a special forces unit to eliminate William Birkin, and also to steal his G-Virus plans before he betrayed them. And as a last resort, they sent in a few more tyrants to Raccoon City. One of them was named Mr. X. Nemesis wore the same jacket as Mr. X during its mission. It was given a rocket launcher that was too heavy for any human to carry. This weapon was only meant to be used by Nemesis. Some reports indicate that it was carrying other weapons like a knife, handgun, assault rifle, and grenade launcher. Nemesis also appeared in a movie and other video games where it was seen to use a minigun. In some occasions, Nemesis was seen to use tentacles that would extend from its flesh. It would be used as a weapon and also as a form of infecting other life forms. The tentacles seen on Nemesis are similar to the ones on the Parasite. It would sometimes speak, only to say the word, STARS. The black coat on Nemesis was seen to be bulletproof, but with enough damage, Nemesis could be injured. If its body receives too many injuries, it will mutate, forming more tentacles to infect other victims. During this stage, Nemesis is still under control, but when it mutates again, it turns into a giant creature with even larger tentacles. This mutation causes a conflict between the T-virus cells and the nemesis cells. They swell together and are spat out as a highly acidic compound. Later on, Umbrella would develop the NE beta type parasite. It would attach to the host nervous system while latching onto their back. This parasite would be seen on the outside of the body as opposed to the NE alpha type parasite which was within the body. It could also find a new host if the original body was destroyed. It could also spray a pheromone that would attract zombies. This parasite could also infect and take control of a tyrant, which would create a parasite super tyrant. I believe there's a saying about realizing the joys of life when one is at death's doorstep. Sayings like those are for the weak who are going to die. They attempt to mask their fears with pithy aphorisms. Mortals cannot comprehend what life means for those whose death is not a concern. These are the words of Oswell E. Spencer. As one of the founders of Umbrella Pharmaceuticals, he played a key role in its formation into the Umbrella Corporation it was the most dominant company for more than 30 years, starting from around the 1960s. Its line of work was around pharmaceuticals and the chemicals industry. Throughout his life, Spencer would come up with a plan to replace all humans with a superior race of human beings, given birth by the progenitor virus, which was the original strain of the virus seen in multiple Resident Evil games, and he saw himself as the ruler of this new utopia. This process was meant to change and evolve the Earth. He would later start the first phase of his plan, something called Project W. Through his authorization, they would kidnap the children born from parents with above average intelligence. They were then subjected to a process that would brainwash them. Their personalities were changed in a way to serve Spencer. All the children were then given the surname of Wesker, who was the director of the project. This information was highly classified that it was not logged into the Umbrella archives or in the UMF-013 computer core. The children were then monitored as they grew up and were given the best education in the fields they pursued. But one of them stood out from the rest, Albert Wesker. Spencer noticed how intelligent Albert was, and if all the children were like him, his utopia would be perfect. Later in their lives, the children were eventually injected with a virus, either by force through a health checkup or through the advice of friends. Most of them would die from this virus, but two of them out of 13 had survived. 
They were Albert and Alex. It turns out that Alex had developed a sickness at a young age, but the virus would cure her disease and do nothing more. But the virus had a different effect on Albert. This process was meant to weed out the more gifted children. The prototype virus was very selective on who it would kill. If the host did not possess a certain type of superior genes, then they would die from the virus. Now, if the host does have these special genes, they will survive. After this event, the survivors were programmed to track down Spencer. At the age of 17, Albert would start working for Umbrella, and there he met William Birkin. They were both highly trusted by Dr. James Marcus. Sometime later, they were transferred to the Arkley Laboratory, which was located just outside Raccoon City. William and Wesker would both take part in the assassination of Marcus under the orders of Oswald E. Spencer. Albert Wesker would serve as a double agent, working for STARS while sending information back to Umbrella. He was then given the task to lure the STARS team to the Arkley Laboratory. This was to test the tyrant's abilities against the members of STARS. But Wesker had his own plans, to sell Umbrella's research to a rival company. But first, he wanted the combat data of the tyrant. During the story of the first Resident Evil game, he injected a virus into his body, which was given to him by William Birkin. After luring Chris and the others inside, he betrayed them all. He released the tyrant, but at first attacked Wesker. After the tyrant killed him, the virus inside his body reanimated his dead cells, and Wesker was reborn. The virus granted him superhuman strength, increased speed, and a rapid healing factor. In order to get these powers, he would first have to die. Even though he became a superhuman, the virus was unstable, and the only way to maintain the balance was through a special serum called PG67AW. The proper amount had to be administered, but if too much was injected, it would act as a poison. Near the end of the first Resident Evil game, Umbrella also sent in Sergei Vladimir, commander of the Umbrella military. He was assigned to retrieve the research from the Arkley laboratory. Although he was successful, Albert Wesker was reborn and vowed to get the information back. After a few months, Albert headed to Rockford Island in Antarctica in search of the T. Veronica virus, created by Alexia Ashford. When he failed to defeat Alexia in her mutated form, he ran away. By the end of that story, he was able to extract the virus from Steve Burnside's infected body. Wesker would then be contacted by a South American drug cartel named Javier Hidalgo. Umbrella had previously given him samples of the T-virus. He used it trying to save his sick wife, but that failed. And now his daughter was sick as well. So Wesker gave him the Veronica virus in exchange for a large sum of money. At the end of the story, Javier had merged with the Veronica-infected plant and turned into the V-complex creature. He was eventually defeated by Leon, Krauser, and Manuela. But Wesker did make an appearance in the ending. He was using binoculars to see the burning body of the V-complex creature. Wesker would later track down Sergei in Russia. Umbrella was developing a new B.O.W., stronger than the others. Along the way, he would fight against some tyrants and defeat them. Then, he would go on to defeat Sergei in his mutated form and extract all the files in the Umbrella archives, and then delete everything from the main computer. Wesker would then leak the information he acquired, and Umbrella was held accountable for all the damages. They went bankrupt, and Spencer was betrayed by Albert. Fearing he would be captured, Spencer fled the country and went to his castle in Europe, and there he remained, hiding in secrecy. Alex Wesker left behind a document about Albert's death in the mansion. This affected the success rate of the project down to 18%, so she advised to select new candidates from the pool of failures in hopes of finding a replacement for Albert. This file proves that she was fully aware of Project W. Albert would make an appearance in the story of Resident Evil 4, where he would hire Ada Wong to retrieve a sample of the Plaga Parasite in Spain. Ada does complete her mission, but she sends him a subordinate sample, while giving the dominant sample to her organization so in some way, she betrayed him. But Albert Wesker would later get a hold of Jack Krauser's body and retrieve a dead dominant species, and so he brought it to Tricell, and the research would end up creating the Ouroboros virus. It went through two stages overseen by Albert, and the third variation was designed by Alex Wesker. However, the virus was still not complete. It required the antibodies found within Jill Valentine's body, and so 
she was kept alive during this process. We then go back to the story of Oswald E. Spencer. He would then entrust Alex with all the resources she needed to continue working on the perfect virus. She continued working for him on an island located in the South Seas. But after a year of research and minimal contact, Alex suddenly disappeared, taking with her all the documents, research materials, test subjects, and other researchers. Spencer was betrayed, first by Albert and now by Alex. Albert would later track down Spencer to a castle in Europe. While Spencer is dying from old age, he tells Albert, I was to become a god, but now my candle burns dimly. Isn't it ironic, for one who has the right to be a god will face his own humanity. Spencer also mentions that Albert was manufactured in some way to be an evolved being on Earth. But unlike the others before him, Albert was the only survivor of Project W. Perhaps Spencer just implied who survived the mutation process without any side effects, because Alex also survived, but remained as a normal human. At least, that's what we were told. Spencer's plan was to create a virus that would save his life, to cure him and grant him immortality. He believed his destiny was to rule over mankind, but his withering body was far beyond repair. Time had consumed him. He saw his age as a disease. His own humanity is what ravaged his body. Therefore, he did not become a god. The key to immortality was in the virus manufactured by Umbrella. It has the ability to suppress telomere shortening, which negates the function that limits cell division. But in his current state, Spencer was doomed to die. Albert says to him, the right to be a god, that right is now mine. Spencer then dies at the hand of Albert. We later get to understand the reason of why Albert wants to release the Ouroboros virus upon humanity. He says that with each passing day, humans are one step closer to self-destruction. I'm not destroying the world, I'm saving it. And when this brings about a new genesis, he will be its creator. He believes in natural selection, where the weak must die and the strong survive. Humans have escaped this winnowing for far too long. The combined efforts of Chris and Sheva end up stopping Albert's plans and crashing his plane on a volcano. Seeing his plan has failed, Wesker lets his anger take over and becomes infected with the Ouroboros virus. Despite growing tentacles and having more durability, he moves very slow and is defeated very quickly. It seems this transformation was a downgrade because his original superpowers were far better and kept him alive a lot longer. The story is continued with Alex Wesker getting a sample of the Ouroboros virus. She would conduct her own experiments in a base on the Sojus Vovani island. After some time, she would create the T. Phobos virus, which was named after the Greek god of fear. This virus would be engineered to respond to stress. She had 11 candidates fitted with sensor bracelets. For a good length of time, they were subjected to extreme emotional stress. Three of them would die in this procedure, while the other eight would mutate uncontrollably. They were deemed as failures since they could not control their fear, and so they were disposed of. The T. Phobos virus was designed in a way that its mutation could be controlled. It reacts to the host's mind and emotions. If they do not experience fear and panic, the virus will not cause them any harm. Later in the story, we learn that Alex is sick from an illness. She knows that a mutation will not save her life. So she plans to copy her consciousness into the body of Natalia Korda, who she kidnapped and brought to her island. Natalia is injected with a T. Phobos virus, and a bracelet monitors her fear and mutations. The process would take six months to complete, so Natalia's body is put to sleep beneath the facility. Alex is later confronted by Claire and Moira on her island, and she tells them that her brother, Albert, used death as his salvation. She plans to take her own life and surpass him. She shoots herself and dies, but later on we learn that she survived. The virus inside her, which made her sick, is also what saved her from death. She is brought back to life, but is now changed. Her physical appearance is now of a monstrous hunchback. Six months later, Natalia awakens from her sleep. Around the time Barry Burton arrives to the island in search of his daughter Moira. Unsure of what to do with the little girl, Barry lets her tag along and they work together. When Alex sees Natalia, she notices the young girl has not mutated. Her jealousy and anger grow. She now hates Natalia. Why has Alex's body become so ugly, so wretched and deformed, while Natalia is unaffected and retained her youth? 
As Alex succumbs to her anger and hatred for Natalia, she takes a vial of the T Phobos virus and injects it into her body. She mentions her brother as she transforms, saying that she now understands how Albert felt. Being alive was not enough. She wants to transcend. Alex is consumed by the virus and mutates into a giant monster, a last attempt at killing Natalia, but of course, she fails. There are two endings to this story. The bad ending has Alex Wesker's personality awakening within Natalia. As she kills Alex's mutated body, Barry aims his gun at her, but is unable to shoot the little girl he's grown attached to, and so she disappears and escapes. In the good ending, Moira destroys Alex Wesker in her mutated form, which prevents Dark Natalia's personality from emerging. Two years later after this event, Natalia is seen reading a book by Franz Kafka, an author that Alex Wesker was fond of. Realizing her experiment was a success, she grins with a malicious smile. All the Wesker children are listed as deceased, but they might only refer to their physical bodies because Alex Wesker lives on in the body and mind of Natalia. In Resident Evil 6, it's mentioned that Albert Wesker had a son named Jake Muller, but Albert never knew he had a son. The woman he met ended up going back to Edonia and gave birth to Jake without telling Albert Wesker. His genetic makeup became very important in that story. His antibodies were immune to the infection from the C-virus, a trait that was passed down by his father. Hunters, another bio-organic weapon created by Umbrella. There are many creatures in Resident Evil, so for this video, we're going to look at the Hunter. Around 10 years before a Hunter was created, they chose a frog as an early test subject and they called it the Lurker. But the results proved to be disappointing. The mutated frog did increase in size and strength, but it suffered from low intelligence something that was not viable for military applications. Because of its increased aggression, there was no way to control it. The T-virus strain at the time was not adequate for creating a bioweapon that would remain under their control, so this was a potential safety risk for the Keepers. The Hunter Y or Hunter Gamma series would later have the same problems, but their development went through a different process. It consisted of human DNA, which was bonded with a fertilized amphibian egg that contained the T-virus. They were sometimes called by another name, the Frogger. In Resident Evil 3, a version with claws would make an appearance. Its body would once again resemble a frog, but with no eyes or teeth. Because of this, it would use its large mouth to swallow its prey whole. One factor that makes them too vulnerable is they can only survive in wet environments as they cannot resist dry air or heat. In the year 1981, from a breakthrough in genetic manipulation, the Hunter A series was produced in the Arkley laboratory. Unlike the other versions, this Hunter was created by injecting reptilian DNA into a human embryo and then administering the T-virus as a bonding agent. Their sole purpose was to hunt down any survivors. Unlike the previous subjects, this Hunter was more intelligent, equal to an orangutan, it also developed a hard, keratinized skin, and surprisingly, it was as tough as Kevlar body armor. The company decided to keep one original Hunter A subject and create future clones from it. In the early 1990s, the Arkley Laboratory would produce another bioweapon. It seemed to resemble a Hunter in a small way, but they were labeled as ticks. Their skin had a different texture and color. Along with having antennas, they had sickle-like arms which were used for cutting their prey. This creature was exclusive to the Sega Saturn version of Resident Evil. According to an interview with Yasuhisa Kawamura, who was a scenario writer for Biohazard 3 Last Escape, his original story says that Dr. William Birkin was able to stabilize the T-virus at some point of his research. This led to the creation of the tyrant B.O.W. and the Hunter. But while he was working on his G-virus, the European branches of Umbrella would modify the existing B.O.W.s they would later create the Hunter B. In 1998, the Hunter B was in production. It was a modified version of the Hunter A, but the first specimen turned out to be deformed, and as a result of this, it did not gain the strength of the A models, but it did have improved reflexes, and so they thought it could be useful in some way, so they decided to clone it. At least 20 Bs were ready by September, 
and as a means of testing them for combat, they were released into Raccoon City. In the same year, William Birkin would work on the Hunter R model. Most of this research took place in his underground laboratory in Raccoon City, but some work was also done in the other facility located on ground level. This model did not get much activity, as they were mainly used for combat testing with the Tyrant R. When William Birkin became infected with the G-Virus, a bunch of Hunter R's were released in the facility. While some survivors tried to fight them off, in the end, the Tyrant R was sent in to kill off any remaining Hunter R's. When Resident Evil 2 was released, the Hunters were absent from the game. But on the Nintendo 64 port, the body of a Hunter R can be found in the laboratory. It only shows up in the second scenario and also includes a file from William Birkin. The file goes over the progress of the Hunter R development. Now this same room has something very strange. Is it just me, or does this image over here look like a predator? The shape of its head and the location of the armor does appear to be similar. What do you think? Another file was found in Resident Evil Outbreak. It talks about how a few Hunter R's escaped and a few casualties occurred. The researcher who wrote this also shows signs of regret, saying they never should have created the Hunters. It also states that lowering the temperature will cause them to freeze. A smaller version of the Hunter R was also created, but they were never mass produced. This Hunter U had the same firepower resistance as the larger Hunter R. They were only held in storage in Raccoon City, so they never really got much combat testing. In 2007, a manga called Biohazard Umbrella Chronicles was released. It was limited to only two issues, but it recounts the fall of the Umbrella Corporation. The story was somewhat short, but it shows Chris and Jill going to a Russian village in search of more information, only to find the village has been infected by a virus and zombies are everywhere. They come across Albert Wesker, who is looking for the virus antibodies. They were stored in warehouses across Russia for safekeeping but he escapes before a few Delta Hunters appear. Most of them are killed by Chris, but later in the story, one of the Hunters tries to attack Wesker, but he's able to kill it very quickly, showing he's still a very powerful enemy, even against B.O.W.'s. In the novel called Resident Evil Underworld, which is written by S.D. Perry, the Hunters are one of the main enemies of the story, appearing in multiple sections. The Hunter Gamma and Hunter Beta series also appeared in the other novels by S.D. Perry. Despite Umbrella creating multiple variations of the Hunter species, it seems the Hunter A model was the most promising version. Even when Umbrella wanted a better model, this one stood the test of time. Albert Wesker would later provide a rival organization with Umbrella's classified data of the prototype Hunter A. They would be responsible for creating the Hunter 2, sometimes called the Improved Hunter. It displayed to be more intelligent than the previous Hunter A model. They implanted a special device on the left side of its head, which also came with an eyepiece, and with the help of an automated surveillance device called a Seeker or Spotter, the Hunter 2 was able to track down its target much easier through the use of a special frequency. The novel of Code Veronica does mention another variation of the Hunter 2. Its skin is now reddish with purple veins. Scales have grown on their body, and their eyes were now red. Aside from their physical changes, they function the same way, except now having poison on their claws. The sweeper was meant to go through previously attacked areas and finish off anything that was still alive. There was a subspecies of the hunter that was very different. They looked like smaller versions of the hunter gamma model. They would hunt in packs and mostly rely on darkness for ambushes, but their attack method was different. They would jump on their prey and vomit in their faces. However, they were considered a failed experiment. According to the story in Resident Evil Dead Aim, the Hunter Elite model was more powerful than the standard Hunter. They were developed in a way to surpass all the other versions. This creature was the product of the finest researchers in the European branch of Umbrella. The Hunters would return in Resident Evil Revelations, but they were given a different name, Farfarello, which can also translate to Goblin. This prototype was made by a terrorist group. They took a regular hunter and injected it with the T Abyss virus. It grew larger in size and gained increased muscle mass. But one unique thing about it was that it could camouflage within its surroundings, which made it even more dangerous. According to a file in a crash site nearby, they were given a sedative every hour during transport. They could be controlled to some extent, but when they were fully active, their actions were unpredictable. 
the effect of the drug must have worn off at some time, and then they escaped. Resident Evil Revelations 2 did have the hunter species in the game. They looked similar to the Alpha and Hunter 2 models, but they were larger and walked slowly, but still retained increased agility for running and hopping. The Resident Evil franchise has spawned many video games, comic book stories, and movies, each one telling a different story and introducing new characters and bioweapons. There are so many types of creatures to cover in this franchise. Some of them look humanoid, quadrupedal, and others have entirely new designs. But in almost every situation, it seems, the more dominant species is always the physically weaker one, the human race. And through countless times, Umbrella's plans have been foiled by humans. Despite their obsession for creating the perfect bioweapon, each one has been defeated in different ways, but in the end, it all comes down to intelligence. No matter how big or how strong you make a bioweapon or creature, their survival is dependent on how well they can adapt to the situation. What are liquors in Resident Evil? When the T-Virus outbreak occurred in Raccoon City, the zombies were actually an accidental development. The liquors were intentionally created as bioweapons. The liquors were the result of another variant of the T-Virus during a dormant state. This new project was trying to reactivate the body of a host that was incapacitated. This could have been caused from a coma, being wounded, or starvation. This variant of the T-Virus would be used to ensure the body of the host would survive. The process was called VACT. By causing significant mutations, this resulted in a new type of zombie that was more resistant to firepower. This would be named the Crimson Head Zombie. Because it was more aggressive than the standard zombie, it could not be studied anymore, and so it was locked away within a sarcophagus in a cemetery. During this time at the Arkley Laboratory, another strain of this virus would form and be responsible for creating the liquors. You can see the Crimson Head Zombie does share some similarities to a liquor. They have sharp teeth, some skin is torn away from the body, and their hands have developed large claws. The liquors have evolved from their zombie state and turned into a BOW that relies on cunning and stealth. The liquors could even be controlled by inserting a modified plaga into the host's body. The plaga is a parasite that can control the host's nervous system. Different versions were created for specific purposes. They were used on some animals like dogs and humans. Another one was made to turn the host's wishes into commands, and the last one resembled a leech. It was used to create bioweapons. Now the word plaga is derived from the Latin word las plagas, which basically means plagues. The mutation that the liquor undergoes is very different. Its flesh is peeled off while revealing its muscles underneath. The brain becomes fully exposed and its lips are pulled back. It drools a lot while crawling around stretched out. It can scale the walls and ceilings fairly easily. Now its bone structure is changed to give them a more quadrupedal form. This gives them the advantage to pounce on a target. It was given the name of the liquor because of its unique method of attacking. The mutation has also caused its tongue to become more elongated and strong enough to cut through flesh. The tongue can be used to swipe at targets or to pierce them like a lance. Lickers are also known to be great jumpers, leaping from across the room to swipe at a target with their large claws. They would normally give off a scream right before jumping, and sometimes will not attack unless they are provoked. While they do lack any visible eyes, they have super developed hearing. There have been some sightings of a licker with a darker skin tone. It seems to be more aggressive but there is speculation that they are modified to become better hunters. Another version was the evolved liquor. It was exposed to the chemical compounds within the gas that was used to exterminate the infected plants. These plants were seen around Umbrella's underground facility. The gas would alter the liquors to develop reptilian skin and increase their muscle mass. Another rare type was something that was called the suspended or the regus liquor. Its physical appearance shows that its mutation took place after a crimson head zombie but before a liquor, but it still had an elongated tongue. Although it could not be used for decapitation, it was mainly used as a whip. The liquors would later be re-examined by a company called Tricell. 
they were modified with more viral infections to become more powerful hunters. This new beta version was given the progenitor virus and it was called the Liquor B. It performed the same way except that its senses became more heightened. There was also an advanced liquor in the first Resident Evil movie. When it consumed fresh DNA, it would grow to become a faster, stronger hunter. It was able to break through barricaded steel doors with minimal effort, and it also showed greater resilience from damage. When Alice shot at the outer brain, that did not slow down the advanced liquor at all. There was also an even larger version called the Uber Liquor. It was seen in the movie Resident Evil Retribution. It was very large and fast. It was encountered by Alice in Moscow. Now, even though the liquor is very different from a zombie, information in the video games tells us that the liquor is basically an evolved zombie. I also want to point out that the Uber liquor looks very similar to a Hell Knight from Doom. The character known as Hunk in the Resident Evil franchise is one of the most mysterious and interesting characters. Some early information suggests that he did attend the military training center on Rockfort Island. This facility was made to train Umbrella paramilitary units. They were known as the Umbrella Security Service or the USS. Their first recorded mission was to eliminate Dr. James Marcus. This order was placed by Oswald E. Spencer, who was one of the founders of Umbrella Pharmaceuticals. During the 1970s and 1980s, a rift between Marcus and Spencer would push them apart. Marcus would confine himself inside his lab, and after 10 years of research, he created the T-Virus. With his research making considerable results, he planned to become the CEO of Umbrella, a position already taken by Spencer. Marcus would also take in Dr. Wesker and Dr. Birkin as assistants. They helped him develop bioweapons and uncover secrets in viral research. In 1988, Spencer sent his USS team to eliminate Marcus. One of the members of this mission was Hunk. Although back then, they wore different uniforms and without a gas mask. But they still operated within two-man teams and they used MP5 submachine guns. After Marcus was eliminated, William Birkin would take over the T-Virus research and take credit for creating it. The body of Marcus was thrown into the waters of a sewage plant, but the queen leech that he was working on found its way to his body, and over the course of 10 years, their bodies had merged together to form a new hybrid. Marcus was reborn and sought out revenge against Umbrella. William Birkin would continue his viral research to create bioorganic weapons. His breakthrough happened when he made the G-Virus. It was superior to the T-Virus in every way. When Umbrella discovered that he was going to sell it to the US government for military applications, they sent out the USS to eliminate William Birkin and steal his research. Hunk was the leader of Alpha Team assigned to recover the G-Virus samples. After William was gunned down in his own lab, they took his research. But not before, William kept one last sample. He injected the G-Virus into his own body. He knew the G-Virus would be able to revitalize cellular functions. It was his last chance at revenge, or else he was going to die. William mutated immediately and chased Alpha Team through the sewers. He managed to kill them all except for Hunk, who was knocked out but did not suffer any fatal injuries. William, who is now a mutated creature, would consume the G-Virus samples and crushed the T-Virus samples with his foot. The rats would become infected by the spilled T-Virus, and they would spread the virus through the water supply in the sewers. When Hunk regained consciousness, he made his way through the sewers, fighting through hordes of mutated creatures. When he reached the rooftop of the Raccoon Police Department, a helicopter picked him up, and his mission was over. After this event, his team was given a mission to transport a special container. This was located in Antarctica, and they had to make their way to Rockford Island. The base commander at that time was Alfred Ashford, and he refused to give details on the contents of the cargo. Hunk was troubled by this decision because it put their safety in jeopardy. Although his story ended here, he was seen in other Resident Evil video games as a bonus character. But in Resident Evil Outbreak, his design was used for another character. Unlike his other comrades, Hunk would always remain calm during a mission. 
He was so skilled in combat that he would even take on some B.O.W.s. He would always focus on the mission objective and feel no remorse for any loss of human life. His strong will, commitment, and concentration is why he always completed his mission. His real name is a mystery, but during his ending in the Umbrella Chronicles, a reflection of his face can be seen. And also, in Resident Evil 3, an epilogue file of Hunk is found, and it shows his real face. The name Hunk was his code name, but he was nicknamed Grim Reaper because of his ability to survive very dangerous situations. Now in Japanese, his name was translated from the word Shinigami-san. It was a reference to Shinigami, which is a god related to death. Because the word San in Japanese can mean Mr., Miss, or Mrs., the word Mr. was left together in the translation, which is why some people call him Mr. Death. During the ending of the Umbrella Chronicles, Hunk even calls himself Death. There was even a female version of this character called Lady Hunk, but she did not have much of a story. Who is William Birkin in Resident Evil? And what is the G-Virus? The story of this virologist began at the early age of 16 in the year of 1977. His executive training program was overlooked by Dr. James Marcus, and in the same school, Dr. Albert Wesker and him developed a friendly rivalry. Over time, the two became the top students of their class and became assistant researchers to Dr. Marcus himself. William was then transferred to the Arkley Laboratory and developed an interest in a virus from West Africa. During his research into modifying the T-virus, he met Lisa Trevor. She was the daughter of George Trevor, who was the architect that designed the Spencer Mansion. He was killed off in an attempt to keep the Arkley Laboratory a secret. His wife and daughter later became hosts for the progenitor virus. His wife died while his daughter survived, only to be used as a test subject for many years into her adult life. Then sometime in 1981, Umbrella employed Dr. Alexia Ashford at the age of 10. She was praised for her genius, and with his own experiments failing, William shunned away from his colleagues. Although, this rivalry with Alexia was only in his mind. William would continue working, trying to create something that would outdo everyone. A breakthrough occurred when he and Dr. Wesker created the Hunter Alpha model. It was made through a process of bonding reptilian DNA with a fertilized human egg. Then sometime in 1983, Dr. Ashford passed away, but William continued his work and met another researcher named Annette. Then, in the mid-1980s, their daughter Sherry was born. Sometime later, Marcus was displaying unusual behavior by isolating himself in the Arkley Mountain Laboratory, and so Umbrella ordered him to be removed. He was killed, and this led to William receiving a promotion to chief researcher at the Arkley Laboratory. Then, all records of Marcus were erased, and his legacy of being the creator of the T-Virus was passed down to William Birkin, he was then labeled as its creator. His work would later continue with some research into the nemesis alpha parasite. It was placed into Lisa Trevor's brain and she absorbed it. This was the basis to an early version of the G-Virus. Later on, this led to the development of an underground site beneath Raccoon City. William worked on the G-Virus at this site, while Albert Wesker became the head of the Arkley Laboratory. During this time, William and Annette would bribe the chief of police, Brian Irons, he was to keep their research a secret. The G-Virus was meant to create powerful bioorganic weapons while still retaining their intelligence. This was different from the T-Virus. It had the power to revitalize cellular functions. But when he and Wesker failed to reopen Dr. Marcus's laboratory, they feared their conspiracy against Dr. Marcus would be revealed. So instead, they destroyed the facility. But William was unwilling to leave his research behind. Fearing that he would no longer become an Umbrella executive, he made plans to leave the company. This is when Wesker would lead the STARS team to the mountains to infiltrate the Arkley laboratory which suffered a viral outbreak. Wesker managed to fake his own death while some survivors made it out of the mansion. When they returned to the police department, their investigation was kept restricted by Chief Irons. William would then engulf the disposal plant with so much bio-waste that it would infect the staff and turn them into zombies. Umbrella would then learn about William's suspicious behavior, and they worried they would lose the only samples of the G-Virus. 
William had planned to hand over the G-Virus to the U.S. military in exchange for protection, but he was shot by the special team sent by Umbrella. They took a case full of T-Virus and G-Virus samples while William was slowly dying. Knowing he was going to die, he injected the last sample of the G-Virus into his own body. He transformed into a creature named G. Now bent on revenge, he tracked the team down and killed them off. He destroyed the samples of the G-Virus along with the T-Virus, which was consumed by rats who had spread the virus into the water supply. During his mutation, William would only be able to create offspring by injecting a parasite into specific hosts. One of them was his daughter Sherry, who he infected when he found her in the sewers. She would receive a vaccine that only suppressed the G-Virus mutations in her body. G would battle against Leon and Claire, and his body would mutate when it received enough damage. He went through various forms, and each one became more powerful. His later mutations would take over his body and mind, mutating him into an uncontrollable monster. Near the end of its lifespan, G would mutate into a four-legged creature. It had a large mouth with long teeth. When this form takes too much damage, the G-Virus cells start to fall apart, and instead of healing its wounds, it turns into a giant mass of flesh, tentacles, and a large mouth. This would be its final form, but it was defeated when a bomb exploded on a train. The mutated version of William Birkin is my second favorite creature in the Resident Evil franchise. The creature known as G has one of the highest number of mutations. Compared to other creatures, it has a total of five different forms, but the third mutation is the one I like the most, and you can see it's very different from a tyrant. And seeing how they both come from different strains of the progenitor virus, they both share the quality of having massive arms with long claws. Who is Mr. X in the Resident Evil franchise? He stands around 6 feet and 11 inches tall, and having massive amounts of brute strength and stamina. This being seems to be humanoid in appearance, but it's actually a tyrant. Its name was never really Mr. X by Umbrella, but was merely given that name by Claire Redfield in the novel Resident Evil City of the Dead. This version of the Tyrant was more intelligent than the early models. Some details suggest this is because part of its composition was derived from the NE-alpha parasite. Because the NE-alpha parasite could be programmed to take orders, a slightly different procedure was done. They extracted a substance called beta hetero non serotonin from the human brain. This substance would act as an adrenal-based neurotransmitter the active cells could only be taken from a live subject. This operation was done without any anesthesia. Various subjects were homeless people that nobody would know are missing. Despite its human-like appearance, it cannot communicate with humans. It is simply a weapon following out orders. And because of this, its actions could lead to undesired accidents. It may end up destroying important equipment without realizing it. Its only focus is the objective of the mission. During the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union saw its army start to disarm. A man named Sergei Vladimir was the colonel of the Soviet army, and with no place left to go, Umbrella would recruit him. He then became the colonel of the UBCS, which was focused on rescue missions during a viral outbreak. But he also contributed his genetic makeup as a base for the early tyrant models like the T-001 and T-002. Ten clones of Sergei would later become the basis of the T-103 model. Sergei spent a lot of time working on future Tyrant projects. He even assisted in designing the Ivan models, which later became his personal bodyguards, and also Talos, which he considered to be his masterpiece. Sergei had a fondness to the Tyrants and said, The Tyrants are my brothers, and my brothers and I issue in a new era for all mankind. Mr. X was merely another Tyrant 103 model. During the events of Resident Evil 2, a batch of six Tyrants including himself were deployed. Mr. X was labeled as batch number T-00. Five others were sent to eliminate US troops that had taken over the incineration disposal plant in Raccoon City. It was owned by Umbrella, but also served as a facility that created gases and medicines to dispose of experimental bodies that were infected by the T-Virus, and Mr. X was sent to retrieve the G-Virus. This was during the same time that Hunk was also deployed for the same mission. 
this tyrant model was more persistent than previous models. It showed to break through walls as it chased Leon and Claire throughout Raccoon City. They would also have power limiters implanted to remain under human control and to follow instructions, but these devices are prone to damage in battle or by environmental hazards. If this device is damaged, the tyrant might just act on instinct. When its body receives enough damage, it will start to mutate. It grows in muscle mass and giant claws are formed on both hands. At this stage, it grows in speed, strength, and resilience to damage, but its heart does still appear on its chest, but not as much as the early tyrant models. With the loss of the power limiters, this tyrant will roam freely, attacking anything it sees. But most super tyrants continued to chase their previously assigned target. The Tyrant 103 model had gone through different designs during production. Some early artwork shows it could have used weapons and a gas mask, and one version even had a massive blade on one arm. As the Tyrant 103 model was mass produced, another version was seen in the Eastern Slav Republic. They were found in a lab under the Presidential Palace. Its normal form was similar to the T-103 model, but taller. But its Super Tyrant form did not have an exposed heart, which made it harder to kill. It also only grew a partially mutated claw on one hand. This Tyrant proved to show more intelligence in being able to catch a rocket in mid-flight with its left hand. It also went up against many lickers, but it defeated them all fairly easily with its brute strength. There have been many variations of the Tyrant, but I want to look at this model because it's my favorite Tyrant, especially in its Super Tyrant form. The story of the Veronica virus takes place in Resident Evil Code Veronica. Alexander Ashford was a geneticist who worked for Umbrella Pharmaceuticals. According to the family tree of the Ashford dynasty, Alexander was the last legal heir to the Ashford name. But during his time employed by Umbrella, he assisted his father in research around the progenitor virus. It was an ancient virus found in West Africa. But there was something very unique about this virus. It was a double-stranded virus that could infect humans, animals, plants, and fungi, something that is rarely seen in a single-stranded virus. Despite his research into virology, it was a field he had very little interest for. Instead, he pursued genetic engineering, and with that knowledge, his greatest achievement was discovering the human gene that regulated intelligence. However, he was not rewarded for his discovery and remained as a minor scientist. His initial plan was to revive the legacy and reputation of the Ashford family. The founder of the Ashford family was Veronica. She was a 19th century noblewoman and was known for her intellect and beauty. At a young age, she excelled in every subject like mathematics, biology, and linguistics. She was so brilliant that when she was 10 years old, she already had a postgraduate education and was fluent in 10 different languages. Alexander wanted to bring back Veronica in some way. Her body was entombed in the Ashford's European home, so he took samples of her DNA and combined it with his own, along with a dangerous gene that increased intelligence. The end result were two clones, Alexia and Alfred. He tried to keep their origins a secret and hid their records in a secret room at the Antarctic base. While Alfred only had above average intellect, it was Alexia who possessed a great amount of intelligence. At the age of 10, Alexia would become the chief senior researcher at Umbrella. She created the T. Veronica virus, which was a result of combining the original progenitor virus with one that was found inside a fossilized ant queen. The virus found inside the ant queen was unable to jump to different species, which is the opposite of the progenitor virus. The social nature of the ants is to obey their queen, so Alexia decided to combine the two viruses along with adding plant genes. Meanwhile, her brother Alfred would locate a secret room that can only be opened by three family gemstones. He had access to two of them already, and the third one was taken from his father. When he accessed the room, he learned about the origins of himself and Alexia. He was merely an experiment by his father. Alfred was driven mad from what he discovered. As time went by, Alexander realized that Alexia was becoming obsessed with the T. Veronica virus. 
she planned to infect herself with it and release it upon the world. And so Alexander left behind an experimental anti-BOW weapon called the Linear Launcher. It was a last resort to stop Alexia if she tried to go through with her plans. Alfred grew a hatred for his father because he was not made to be as intelligent as Alexia. So Alfred captured his father and used him as a test subject for the T. Veronica virus. Alexander would mutate into a creature with extra appendages, an exposed heart, and was uncontrollable. Because this form lacked any intelligence, he was deemed a failed experiment and locked away in a secret room. He was named Nosferatu, which is a Greek name of disease or plague carrier. His transformation was slightly different in Code Veronica when compared to the Umbrella Chronicles, but his story remained the same. Alexia would then inject her own body with a T. Veronica virus, but decided to keep her body in cryogenic suspension for 15 years. Her plan was to allow the virus to mature slowly over time with her body. She started this procedure at the age of 12. During this time, Alfred's mind would become more unstable. He would miss Alexia so much that he would turn into a crossdresser and pretend to be Alexia. This was a sign of a split personality. This was around the time Claire and another inmate would escape a prison on Rockfort Island. Alfred Ashford was the base commander at this time. But when it was attacked by Umbrella forces in search of the virus, he tried to escape back to his home in the Antarctic. Albert Wesker would learn that Alexia has the last sample of the T. Veronica virus, and so he makes a plan to visit her home in the Antarctic. Claire and Steve would take a plane that was autopiloted with coordinates to where Alfred Ashford was going. When they arrived, they were pursued by Alfred, but Steve would end up wounding Alfred. But as Alfred ran away, he was able to awaken Alexia. And with his final breath, he would see Alexia come back after 15 years. Alfred's death was different in the Umbrella Chronicles, where it is Alexia who kills him because he took too long to awaken her. At the age of 27, Alexia was in full control of her powers. The procedure of cryogenic suspension for 15 years allowed her body to merge with the T. Veronica virus without losing her intelligence. As Alexia holds her brother's dying body in her arms, she takes control of a plant tentacle from underneath the base. It goes after Claire and Steve and captures them. But she decides to use Steve as another test subject. He mutates into a large creature with a giant axe. He is later seen chasing Claire, but ends up saving her. Steve was able to retain his sanity, but died by a plant tentacle controlled by Alexia. Now, around this time, Chris Redfield reached the Antarctic base in search of his sister Claire. Albert Wesker was also here in search of the T. Veronica virus. Wesker and Chris would both encounter Alexia in the mansion. Alexia would transform to where she would have superhuman strength, increase durability, and her blood would become flammable. She had a short battle with Wesker until he realized he was no match for her, so he fled the scene and left Chris to battle Alexia. He won the battle, but Alexia was not dead. She would later fuse with one of her breeder pods and go into a second transformation, but was defeated by Chris again. Her final transformation was a giant dragonfly that detached from the breeder pod. She was finally destroyed by Chris Redfield when he used the linear launcher on her. After Alexia's death, Wesker had acquired Steve's body and extracted the T. Veronica virus from him. He left behind his star's knife and a message to Chris saying, I won this game. He would sell the virus to a drug lord named Javier Hidalgo, who was based in Latin America. He used it on his wife and daughter in an attempt of saving their lives. His wife Hilda was lost when she mutated, but his daughter Manuela was able to survive a disease. However, Manuela's organs had to be replaced to keep her alive. Javier also secretly grew a Veronica plant in his mansion's greenhouse. The Veronica plant would infect other vegetation and turn them into Veronica plants. It could destroy an entire ecosystem if it escaped. As a last resort, Javi approached the Veronica plant and allowed it to absorb him to create the V-complex creature, but he was defeated with the help of his daughter Manuela, who was still infected with the T. Veronica virus. The research around the T. Veronica virus was not over. A scientist named Carla Radimus, who is brilliant in genetics, would acquire a sample of the virus. After some time, she was able to remove the genetic code that caused sudden genetic mutations. This variant would be called the T02. 
She would then merge it with the G-virus sample found in Sherry Birkin's body. This meant the test subject would not suffer brain damage, but would acquire instant mutation in minutes. This eliminated the need for the host to merge with the virus for 15 years like Alexia did. It would become an intelligent, bioorganic weapon. This would become the C-virus, but Carla would also call it the perfect virus. There was another virus that had similar properties to the T. Veronica virus. It was called the T plus G virus. It was made by combining the T virus with the antibodies of the G virus. This virus was used to create the Tyrant 091, which replaced its arms with tentacles. These long tentacles would act as fingers, and its weak point was an exposed heart, which was sticking out from its back. This Tyrant variation was considered a failed experiment because it lacked an electrical current, something the T plus G virus was designed to produce. This virus was also used by Morpheus D. Duval. He used to work for Umbrella, but later became a bioterrorist. He stole two viruses from Umbrella and held the world ransom for $5 billion. Near the end of the story, he used this virus on himself and took on a more feminine form. It's unclear if this was due to the T plus G virus or because Morpheus had already undergone surgery to keep his youthful appearance and possibly some gender reassignment surgeries. Morpheus was able to control his mind in his first form but lost control during his second form because of the G virus mutations. What is the story of Ada's boyfriend, John? During the events of Resident Evil 2, Leon Kennedy meets up with a woman named Ada Wong. She arrived in Raccoon City during the zombie outbreak. When she finds a reporter named Ben, she brings up her boyfriend named John. From a rumor she heard, she assumed he was in the city, but later in the story she finds out John had passed away. You can pick up a file in Resident Evil 2 which is called The Researcher's Letter. It dates back to June 8th of 1998, and it serves as a last note to Ada Wong. John's test turned back positive, just as he expected. He already knew he was infected, and was turning into one of those zombies. While Ada was not infected, he decided to help Ada retrieve important data about his work. She was to activate the self-destruct device and then escape with the files. John wanted to expose Umbrella for what they were doing, so he relied on Ada to help him. She could access the system by using his name to log in and her name as the password, John and Ada. This would unlock the visual data room on B2. In his last moments, he writes that if Ada should find him changed, his wish would be for her to end his life, or what was left of it. Later in the story, Annette Birkin would tell Leon that he was helping a spy. Ada had gotten close to John just to get information about Umbrella. The login name and password is actually used in the first Resident Evil game. By accessing a computer, you would unlock doors B2 and B3. This can also be seen in the HD remake of Resident Evil, but with an updated interface. Aside from these small clues to John's existence, all the important details about his life and work were left out of the game. But in 1998, the Resident Evil comic book did mention more information about John. It takes place before the events of the first game. We get a glimpse of John writing a letter to Ada. He's been doing research on the T-virus. While he was expecting it to have positive effects, the virus ended up deteriorating the host body. But John was hopeful this work would lead to a breakthrough in cancer research. But it would be years before they could start work on human test subjects. John was trying to get security clearance for Ada to join his team, but this never happened. During his early years, John always knew he would end up with a career in science. His work focused on bioengineering cures for viral blood infections. This led to several presidential appointments, but the government moved too slow for his taste. While he waited on funding, Umbrella approached him with an offer he could not refuse. On May 10th of 1998, John would oversee the results of a month-long project. The T-virus was introduced to a subject's bloodstream. As he continued to see signs of physical deterioration, this also resulted in signs of unprovoked aggression, but they were able to control it by the use of sedatives. 
A few days later, the same subject started to show an unexplained increase in strength and aggression. It might be linked to a decrease in brainwave activity. Later on, it broke free of its restraints and escaped the lab. John would later start to get sick. He ignored the symptoms, only thinking it was the flu. With so much going on at the lab, he barely had time to take care of himself. John would also inject the T-virus into a shark. It took around five weeks for the subject to show signs of deterioration. If he could figure out why some subjects take so long to be affected by the T-virus, it could lead to a breakthrough. Now on May 31st, John fears other people in the compound were exposed to the T-virus. It will take a week to find the results of their test. But he is also paranoid from the strange men watching over him. What is the T-002 subject? Have I been tricked into working on some biological weapon? On June 8th, knowing his body is infected, we see John writing his last letter to Ada. This includes his login name and password to obtain his research data and release it to the public. He is glad Ada was never assigned to his team. She avoided infection for not being there. But as John struggles to finish his letter, he loses control of his actions and rises from his chair. As he turns around, the door behind him opens up. Jill Valentine finds John is now a zombie and puts a few bullets into his body and ends his suffering. The letter they found was written by John Fay. Umbrella wanted to see the results of human exposure to the T-virus, so they sacrificed their own researchers. The end result was a zombie with boosted strength, resilience, and aggression. It creates the perfect soldier, mindless, fearless, deadly, and disposable. And that's where the story of John ends. While the comic book has his name as John Fay, other sources would list him as John Clemens. Now, George Romero had produced a movie script for Resident Evil, which was turned down. In this story, this character was listed as John Marcus, and his relationship with Ada was still included. It goes to show that a man with good intentions was used by Umbrella, and Ada, the woman he fell in love with, also used him. So that covers a lot of topics around the Resident Evil universe. For a game that started out as a survival horror, it sure has come a long way. With each new video game, comic book, novel, or movie, we always get new lore to dive into. Out of all the enemies in Resident Evil, my favorite is still the creature that William Birkin turned into, and my second favorite would be Mr. X. If you enjoyed this one hour video, please leave a like rating. If you want to see more content like this, then subscribe to my channel. You should also enable notifications. This way, you'll get notified when I upload a video. Before I end this video, I want to ask you a question. Who is your favorite character or enemy in Resident Evil? Put your answer in the comment section. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.